Welcome to Books in the Freezer, a podcast dedicated to the deliciously disturbing world of horror fiction. I'm your host, Stephanie, and today I am with podcast favorite author Riley Sager to talk about his latest novel, Survive the Night. Riley, once again, welcome to the show. Hey there. Thank you for having me and podcast favorite. That is so cool. You're just saying that. <laughs> I am not. People love your books. I think uh, like people talk to me about Home Before Dark like all the time. That is so cool. Like I it's weird when you when you create it, you know, all the flaws and the stress and everything that went into the creation of this book. And it's so weird to I never get to see it from the other side as someone who's just reading this thing for enjoyment and enjoying it. So it's it's. <laughs> It's always nice to hear when people are like, yeah, I loved this. Yeah, I could imagine that. Yeah, I did. a, I made a TikTok of like Haunted House book recommendations, and I had a lot of people comment back that they loved Home Before Dark. Oh, that is that is so cool that I'm I'm very proud of the the reception that book has gotten. Like so many people love it. And I'm glad that like, I could scare them. It was scary. But this year we have Survive the Night coming out. So can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, Survive the Night. It is about a college student named Charlie, and she is named after the character from Alfred Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt. For those who there are people who hear Charlie and they're like, is that Shadow of a Doubt? It's like, yes. <laughs> but so it's, it's a college student named Charlie, and um, her best friend and roommate has been murdered by a man known as the Campus Killer. And so Charlie just needs to leave campus grief stricken and guilt ridden and she just can't stay there a moment longer. So the book takes place in 1991. And in the 90s, at least, how college students often got home was through the campus ride board, where people would put up their little flyers with like, hi, I'm going to Ohio, need a ride. And they'd put their phone number. And that's how you, you would basically like get into a car with a stranger for several hours. And that's exactly what Charlie does. And at the ride board, she meets a fellow student named Josh, who is going the same direction she is. And so they decide to share the ride to Ohio. And pretty much as soon as they get to the highway, Charlie starts to suspect that Josh isn't exactly who he says he is and that he might be a very, very dangerous man. And she's stuck in a car with him. Uh, so tense. I, I can't imagine just like the idea of a ride board. But I mean, I guess that's what we do with Uber today, essentially. Not for like, I guess, long trips like that, but just the idea of that creeps me out. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so hard to wrap your head around it now. But back then it was it was how people got places. And it was almost like school sanctioned hitchhiking. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. The story revolves a lot around film noir. If someone's coming at this book with little understanding or background are there films that you would recommend to pair with the book well it, it helps to have seen shadow of a doubt hitchcock classic very it's not one of his most known films so it's it's kind of under the radar but it's great i also think silence of the lambs is a good one because that came out in 1991 and it's when survive the night takes place and so there was a fascination with serial killers going on at that time in pop culture. And I think another good one, and I, I'd only put this together like recently, is Misery. Because oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's two people yeah. in a confined space, and one of them might be very super dangerous. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one to watch, too. Oh, definitely. Was it fun to write like a film major protagonist? It was, and it was also easy because I was a film studies major, like Charlie was. And so it really saved on having to do, well, any research because <laughs> I, was, I was pulling all these movies from memory. Uh, but it, it was fun because movies are fun and, and yeah. movies are like this this international language, like people all over the world. They might not have seen Psycho, but they know about the psycho shower scene. And so it's a great emotional shorthand in a way. If, if, if Charlie's in a certain situation and she mentions a certain movie, and if you are familiar with that movie, you know exactly what she's feeling. And so it was a great way to connect her and the reader 
together through cinema. Definitely. I was going to ask about the overlap in your uh, favorite films between you and Charlie, because I know at one point in the book, Charlie mentions that she doesn't like The Sound of Music or like trust people who like The Sound of Music. And last year you told us that was one of your favorites. It is absolutely <laughs> one of my favorites. And I, I just, it's a really fun in joke. Well, one, because Sound of Music is a big part of Home Before Dark. And so those yeah. who read that will be like, oh, that's funny. But those who really know like that I love, love, love Sound of Music will see that line and just chuckle because Charlie is basically <laughs> saying like, if you like the sound of music, I don't want to know you. <laughs> that is funny. I liked the use of the different tropes in the storytelling. Like, Charlie is so self-aware in the way that she talks and is, like, telling the story. And I feel like at times is so, I guess, aware <laughs> that this is, like, a story set up and talks about, you know, being the femme fatale and the leading lady. Yeah, and, and trying to think through a, a cinematic lens. Like, she, I liked when I was coming up with the scenes of her comparing herself to the character of Charlie in Shadow of a Doubt, who was far more strong and plucky and resourceful than book Charlie thinks she is. And so she's like, okay, what would movie Charlie do in this situation? She would be brave. She would be smart. She would ask questions. And so Charlie starts to ask questions. And so she kind of becomes not herself, but becomes how she thinks this character would act in this situation. So it's a little bit of acting she's doing on her own. Was it fun to go back to the 90s for the story? It was so much fun. And it, it started just from a logistical standpoint. Like I knew... I would not be able to tell this particular story in present day because it would be five pages. Like she, <laughs> she would, you know, Google Josh. She would look at his Facebook page. Even if she got in the car with him, which she wouldn't, she would be like, no, I'm done here. She'd call someone for help, call the police, look up GPS to see her location, hail an Uber and it would be over. And so I knew like I needed to strip the story of modern technology where you're at the mercy of payphones and roadmaps mm -hmm. and strangers. And so that was that was why I went back to the 90s. And it's just it's it's fun to talk about the movies and the music and the clothes that were going on back then. Oh, yeah. Well, I feel like a lot of that plays a, a big part into the story, like, you know, Nirvana and the the movies of the time. Uh so did you ever find yourself having to like look up like, wait, oh, no, I can't mention that because that hadn't come out yet? No, because I was a senior in high school in November of 1991. So it's a time and place you were you knew very well. <laughs> you remember that perfectly. And so every movie, every song, it was like it's November 19th, 1991. And I knew so. OK, Sons of the Land's been out. Thelma and Louise has been Beauty and the Beast has not come out yet. So she can't mention that because she hasn't seen it. So like I, I just that was all stored in my brain from like my high school years. This episode is brought to you by Libro FM. Libro FM is the first and only company which lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. You can pick from more than 150,000 audiobooks, including bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company out there. You know the name. But you'll be part of a different story, one that supports community. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. Listen during your commute, while doing chores, walking the dog, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro FM app. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out recommendations and curated lists from people who know audiobooks best booksellers. I mean, and us. We also have a playlist on there full of books that have been recommended on this podcast. Books in the Freezer special offer. You get two audiobooks for the price of one, just $14.99 with your first month of membership using code FREEZERBOOK. This offer is valid for new members in Canada and the United States. Thank you, Libro FM, for supporting the show. Awesome. I wanted to ask about the writing process for this because compared to home before dark i mean this is very different this is you know a, a compact setting with two characters 
uh, you know, taking place over one night. So how different was that writing process to writing, you know, like the book within a book? (laughs) I knew I needed something different and something more narratively simple. It's not. It's a surprisingly complex book, but I wanted to just break it down to bare bones. And you can't get much more bare bones than two people in a car playing Mm -hmm. mind games. And so it it was a a conscious effort to go in the complete opposite direction that Home Before Dark took. And so I, I really responded to the idea of yeah, let's let's see what happens with these two people in this car and how long I can keep them in the car and still keep the tension high and the suspense up and really just have fun with it. <laughs> and say, is it like difficult in a different type of way, I guess, to keep it all compact like that? It, it was difficult because I, I purposely constrained myself. And mm-hmm. so you, you, you don't have bring in suspense and scares in a different way than you might normally do. And so there was a little bit of, okay, what can I do here to like, what is she going, how is she going to like try to hail for help when they're speeding down the highway and and just like coming up with ways like, and I knew that there was the potential for like really tense claustrophobic suspense and I just had to really dig deep and figure out how do I accomplish that. And so I, I hope I did. I think you did. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I think I did too, yeah. So when do you decide on the twist? Very early on in the process. It usually starts off with, okay, idea, what main character would work with this idea, And then where is it going to go? And so I I pretty much always, with maybe one or two exceptions, know exactly where we're going to end up. And so I knew the twist ahead of time. With this book, I didn't know how we were going to get there. So that, for me, was the journey, so to speak, where, like, okay, I know we are going to end up here now let's see which which road we're going to take. That's interesting because I I feel like you are so good at red herrings like we were talking before we recorded. And I feel like every time I read a Riley Sager book, I'm like, I'm going to figure out what's going on this time. I'm going to be ahead of this story. And I always fall for the red herrings like without fail every single time. <laughs> and I don't know if it's because like I hate writing the red herrings pairings because i know mentally that it's not important to the plot <laughs> and so like so i i it's a hurdle that i have to get over it's like okay the reader does not know that this is not important so you have to give it your all yeah and i think i think it it ends up working out for the best because i work extra hard at them now <laughs> so they don't come off as red herrings so i it's it's a weird <laughs> mental gymnastics I have to go through to like get a book finished sometimes that's funny um I had a few questions from patreon supporters Uh, Danielle wants to know what is your favorite horror book Ooh, that is a good question um I'm not sure if it qualifies as horror um red dragon is a hell of a book it's so scary It's so riveting and I haven't read it in a long time and I kind of am afraid to reread it again because it just so terrifying. So I I guess it would be Red Dragon by Thomas Harris. All right. I haven't read that, but I've seen, doesn't that one have like two movie adaptations? It does. And the book is just so much better. Really? Okay. I will have to check that out then. And she also wanted to know if you have a go-to movie recommendation, a horror movie recommendation. Ooh, that's a good one too. I mean, what I recommend everything I everyone has probably already seen. Um, if you haven't seen it, um, Vast of Night on Amazon Prime is really good. The, the 1950s like sci-fi thing, and I I just really dug that movie. But you, you cannot go wrong with It Follows or or um, Scream. So yeah, I'm. 
I'm kind of basic in my horror movie <laughs> recommendations sometimes. Yeah, they're classics for a reason. And Jocelyn wanted to know what drew you to writing thrillers. I think it was just the things that I kind of would start reading and enjoying when I was young. I went straight from Judy Bloom and Charlie in the Chocolate Factory into more adult mysterious fiction like Agatha Christie I was reading in the sixth grade and I, I it all went over my head but I loved it anyway and so and then there were none which I, I think it might be like the first psychological thriller really and then just getting into Stephen King like I went through like a huge Dean Koontz phase Midnight so good I love that book I think after just reading all of these things that I thought it might be cool to try to create them myself yeah it just it's well, I think if you ask most writers like why they write, you'll get a similar answer. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I just always have. And so we tried it and it sort of worked. And it just so, yeah, it, it's I, I can't pinpoint an exact moment where I was like, yeah, I want to do this. It was a gradual awakening, I guess. So what was your first King book? My first one was actually not the best one to start with. It was Eyes of the Dragon. Oh, OK. <laughs> Yeah, which is so <laughs> random, and I didn't really like it. And I'm like, hey, I thought Stephen King was supposed to be scary. This isn't scary. This is just some medieval stuff and blah. And so I was kind of let down by it. And then the next one I read was Misery. Okay. And so then you... I was hooked. Then yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, now I get it. <laughs> oh, man. Stephen King books were, like, not allowed uh, for me growing up so I definitely like hyped them up and like super like mythologized them and I think the first one I ended up reading was it which I think is a good one to start with but it was like one of those things where it's like oh no you can't read those because they I really scared myself at a young age when like I read I to this day I still haven't finished The Shining because The Shining scared me so much when I, I think I was like 13 when I read it or tried to read it <laughs> I think it was one of his scarier ones yeah there were, there were just there were moments but it's it's the guy is it the bear costume like in the hallway yeah after reading that I was like okay it's 1 a.m <laughs> and I have to go to the bathroom but I refuse because there's a guy in a bear costume outside in the hallway you have to turn like all the lights on in the house to do like everything <laughs> Yes. So that one. And I remember reading Pet Cemetery the very first weekend. My parents decided I was old enough to be there alone. Hmm. And so it was like, hmm, my parents are gone. My sister is gone. Most kids like that age would be like, party. And it's like, I'm going to sit here alone in isolation and read Pet Cemetery <laughs> and terrify myself. So, yeah, not a good idea. Oh, man. So I know this year you've been doing like the movie watch alongs again uh, for classic movies like Jaws and Psycho. Do you have any new insights on any of the films rewatching them this time around? Yeah. Um, ones um, when rewatching Sansa, like, and I've I seen that movie like 20 sometimes and there were still new things that I I noticed for the very first time. And one of them is. Um, and it blew my mind when I realized this, but whenever Clarice is talking to Hannibal Lecter or, or in any professional capacity, she wears like this blazer and it's the same blazer. She's always wearing it. And I never noticed it before, but it's like, yeah, of course she would wear the same blazer because she can't afford, this is like the only good blazer she has. And when she's down in the basement with Buffalo Bill, the first thing she does is she, like, takes off the blazer. And it's like she's shedding her cocoon and becoming, like, the FBI butterfly that she is. Wow. And I was, I was, I'm like, wow. There was a lot of thought put into this thing. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of layers to that movie. So many. And it's it's, it's so... Controver I mean, exploring, like, we didn't consider in 1991, but yeah, there is, like, a certain 
unintentional transphobia going on in that movie. And it's like, how do you deal with that from a modern lens? And do you judge it more harshly or, or no? And it's I, I tend to be more forgiving in that regard because I don't think Jonathan Demi, who by all accounts was a wonderful man and a humanist, like intended to do harm to the trans community with this film. Yeah, I know. Like I've seen a lot of um, like op-eds and stuff being written about it recently. Yeah, because the the 30th anniversary was yeah. in February, and it just it still has such a cultural impact to this day. When it comes to your own books, do you think you have a favorite? I yes and no. I mean, it's it's weird. They're they're written under completely different circumstances, and some are like you know people love Home Before Dark. That one was probably my least favorite writing experience because it was just so stressful. So, like, I can't remove myself from the creation of it. So the the one, I mean, I, I will always say, like, the one I'm most proud of is Final Girls because it's the book that literally changed my life. Like, without Final Girls, my life would be very, very, very different right now. And so I... I will always love and be grateful to that book. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, it's the one that started it all for you. Yeah, this it's nowhere. I never, ever thought my wildest dreams like that. I would achieve the things that I've achieved. Like when I was writing that book, I just needed to write the book and hopefully someone would give me a little money for it because I was so financially <laughs> desperate at the time. And, and so like, that was really the main goal. Like I just need to get this book out of my system and hopefully get some money to tide me over until I get like a real job. And um, yeah, now this is my real job and it's crazy. That is so awesome though. It is. And it's, it's so like, I just, I love that story. And like, whenever I, I tell the story of like, yeah, I was laid off and I couldn't get another job and I, everything was awful. And so I wrote a book and the book changed my life. And it's, it's almost like this fairy tale in a way. And it, 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 it kind of happened to me. So it's amazing. That is. Um, so one tradition that we have on the podcast is to ask guests for a chilling obsession or something that you're enjoying in the horror genre, like a movie, show, podcast. I mean, it can be anything. Oh, this is a tough one because I have been avoiding scary <laughs> stuff like crazy lately. Um, I We can expand the meaning of horror. <laughs> During the pandemic, I just kind of went all in on like I was, I, was, I was all about Ted Lasso and Never Have I Ever on Netflix and, and things one. like that. It's so good. <laughs> New season coming out soon. Yes, yes. And so, like, I really have been avoiding scary things. Um, I honestly forget the last scary movie I watched, which is just shameful. I know. Um, can I tell you something that scares me? Will that work? Sure. Oh, gosh. The Mothman. <gasps> oh, yeah. Like the legend, like the urban legend cryptid Mothman. Yes. The Mothman just... For, so, for some reason, him, especially when he's tied in with Indrid Cold, really just, I don't know what it is about all of that. It just terrifies me to my core, and I don't understand it, but it's like this gut-level unease anytime like the Mothman comes up. And he's on all these shows. Like I'm a big fan of Discovery Plus and like Mysteries at the Museum and all these kinds of shows, and invariably there'll be like, Oh, and here's the Mothman. It's like, no! <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. Why didn't you warn me? It's funny. I watched the Richard Gere movie, like, a few months ago for the first time. And I was like, oh, yeah, this was, like, a big a big thing. It's a really good movie. Like, I I tortured myself when I went and saw that in theaters. <laughs> and it it's, it's, it's really good. But, man, that just gets me. And I have, like, there was a thing, I think it was... Josh Gates and Mysteries at the Unknown or something like they they kind of maybe figured out what caused the Mothman. Really? Yeah, I mean they they think there's no definitive proof, but in that area in West Virginia where he was appearing, there was some military testing going on. And so it's a valid theory that 
it was literally soldier testing jetpacks. Oh. And that they were wearing like these night vision goggles that would make their eyes turn red. And so like there was like flying red eyed men in the sky. But it was just like testing jetpack technology. That's very interesting. I think I still want to believe in the Mothman. Like I, I was going through like wickedclothes.com and they have like a whole line of Mothman merch. And I'm like, I kind of want all these. <laughs> like, I want the shirt and the hat. <laughs> <laughs> I should I should wear that ironically. Like yeah. wear my Mothman shirt. So I look brave, but really it's like, and I'm scared. <laughs> oh, man. So our last tradition on the podcast is to ask our guests for a final girl song so last year you picked don't fear the reaper is there another song you would like to add to the playlist this year there is well i I did a playlist for survive the night with songs that are mentioned in the book or that i was listening to to get me in the mood and a, a really good final song final girl song that actually plays an important part in the book is come as you are by nirvana oh nice i was gonna ask if it was gonna be a nirvana song (laughs) yeah that one it was one of the things that first popped into my head when i was thinking about writing this i just pictured a man and a woman in a car playing mind games with each other as nirvana and specifically the beginning of come as you are starts playing on the tape deck and I had to write that in into the oh, book. Yeah. And so I, I do think Come As You Are is a great, great final girl song. Awesome. I will definitely add that to the playlist. And I can also add the Survive the Night playlist if listeners want to check that out. Um, yes, I will. I will email you the link. Like, I'll send you the link to this as soon as we get off this call. Oh, awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Where can people find you online? Um, the easiest way is my website, rileysagerbooks.com. And there, right at the top, are links to my Instagram, my Twitter, and my Facebook. And just warning you, I'm mostly on Instagram and Twitter, Facebook, not so much. So if you really want to find me, like, I'm around Twitter and Instagram all the time. I feel you on that. <laughs> There's a lot of baggage going on with Facebook. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to deal. Yeah, I don't even have it on my phone. So it's just like more of even a hassle to get on Facebook <laughs> to check things. So I rarely check my personal one. Friends of mine might have had kids and that are now like six months old. And I wouldn't know because that's like how rarely I check my Facebook. My like whole lives have changed and we're just totally unaware. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. No, thank you. This is great. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. Thank you again for coming on. Thank you. And well, I'll talk to you next year, I hope. Yeah books in the freezer is a bi-weekly podcast we post episodes every other tuesday you can find us on twitter at books freezer pod on instagram at books in the freezer at facebook at facebook.com slash books in the freezer and we are on tiktok at books in the freezer you can send us an email at books in the freezer at gmail.com If you would like to support the show, there are a few ways you can do that. One of them is to support us on Patreon. There is a one, three, and a five dollar level with all kinds of different perks, including early episode releases, bonus episodes, movie nights, all kinds of stuff. So if that sounds interesting to you, you can check that out at patreon.com slash books in the freezer. Another convenient way to support the show is to use our Amazon link. You just go to the show notes, find the link that'll take you right to Amazon, and you would just do your normal Amazon shopping like you would always do, and a little bit of that goes to help support the podcast. So thank you to all of you that use that. Someone recently purchased a set of glass corked bottles and a pair of professional hair cutting scissors. So all kinds of stuff. Again, thank you to all of you that use the link. If you're looking for a way to support the podcast without spending any money, you know what is a good way to do that is to leave a review on a site like Apple Podcasts or to just spread the word about the podcast, tweet about it, post about it on Facebook, post about it on Insta stories. All of those things help little podcasts like this. So thank you again to all of you that do that and tag me. It makes me so happy.
I'm Stephanie. You can find me on Twitter at Lady underscore Ganya. That's L-A-D-Y underscore G-A-G-N-O-N. Or on Instagram at That's What She Read. And that is That's With Two A's. Uh, so thank you so much. And see you next time on Books in the Freezer. Books in the Freezer.